That's great, David. Thank you so much. Up next, we have Michelle. Michelle, what's your question? Hi, David. Um, I'm just have a question about the mushrooms. So, um, cause I do have mushrooms around here and I've been afraid to pick them. So if I, if I pick one off the tree and you can, you're, you're sure in, in North America that they're safe, <laughs> uh, how long can it be stored? How should I store it? And is there anything in the preparation that um, I should do to make sure that I, it, is, it is food safe, like no listeria or any other, you know, crazy things that we have in our environment today? Okay, great question. What first thing you want to do is let's say you've got this thing coming off of a tree and you're like, okay, let's pick that thing. So you break it off. The next thing you're going to do is you're going to take that bottom surface and you're going to expose that to the sun. That's what you're going to do. You're going to dry the mushroom in the sun and make sure it's crispy dried. Like at this level of crispiness, this thing will last years in this. This was just a box for 15 months. We just literally got it out. It's like, whoa, we can still make tea out of it. It's ready to go. So you dry it upside down in the sun. Now, this, see how that surface is? It's called a pore surface, a polypore. If you're really curious and you're like, well, I'm not sure, you know, I know I'm picking this off a tree and David Wolf said so, but I'm still not sure. If it has a pore surface like that, then it's what we call a polypore. And you can always ID it online. You can always just take a picture of it and go, let me just go online and see if I can find out. I'll look at all the polypores in my region and see if I can identify it, which is a great idea. And I recommend that you do that. Um, but the polypores, I, want, I just want to say this. Eventually, you will realize that the polypores are great allies of humankind. They are close to us. They're close relatives of us. They're part of us. And the relationship we have with Rishi is a deep one. And you can revive that, actually. It's really cool. You can suddenly revive a connection with your environment that our ancestors had. Should you pick all the Rishi that you find? No, I just leave half. Pick half, leave half. Whatever mushroom you're picking, pick half, leave half. Now, ground mushrooms could be deadly toxic, so you've got to be careful. Thanks so much, David. Uh, up next, we have Marsha. <clears throat> Hi, Marsha. What's your question for David Wolf? Hi, David. Thank you so much. Um, I have a question my, uh, regarding my significant other. He's 83 on multiple medications for COPD, arrhythmias, prostate. Can he take the activated charcoal? Would it interfere with his medication? And when would he be able to take it? Great question. Okay. In his case, what you always want to do is separate the medication. I'd say by four hours, that's always the safest bet. And it's better if he takes the charcoal because what's happening is, is that the medications have a lot of derivative side effects and metabolites. And those metabolites can build up and be toxic. Like with thyroid medication, for example, the buildup in people of reverse T3 from taking Synthroid is a big issue. Turns out that, char that charcoal neutralizes reverse T3. It absorbs it, or it's really specifically adsorbs it. So you might want to check with your doctor and just get some baseline numbers. on. Th I don't know what medication, you know, side effects and metabolites he's having, you know, and, but there are, and with every medication, there's always a buildup of certain metabolites that build up in the liver. The charcoal is the way of bringing that down so you neutralize the potential of a dangerous liver buildup. And that's usually what happens with medications. Eventually the liver goes like, hey, whoa, 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 I can't handle anymore. When do you do it? Generally, if he's taking medication throughout the day, wait four hours and take it right before bed and then he's cleaned up for the next day. And over time, you might find him getting better and better and better and better because of that cleanup. And I know that from many years of experience of dishing out charcoal to people on thyroid medication and other medications, but you, so most of the time keeping it away four hours or more and then seeing the improvements and eventually people are like, wait, I'm going to actually get off this thyroid medication. It's fascinating. Actually, we've got people in our group who over the years have gotten off thyroid medication when they were took it, taking it for 20 years. I just want to put that out there. And I'm not, I'm not saying that's possible for everybody, but it is possible for some people. That's Amazing, uh, David, thank you. And up next we have Trevor. Trevor, what's your question for David Wolf? I'm just gonna jump in real quick there, Ben, yes. sorry. Uh, hi, David. Oh, no, there you are, okay. Mm -hmm. I, I just wanted to say 500 milligram dose of charcoal to start, 500 milligrams, simple, just keep it there for a while. If you wanna do more later down the road after months of use, okay, get to a thousand, go more, but 500 milligrams. Okay, sorry to interrupt, go ahead. Thank you, David, great presentation as always. 
Um, you mentioned uh, 50 and then, you know, fasting based on your age and many of us have turned 50. So would the one meal a day count um, any time we're not eating? Can we count that as considered fasting for the 50 times that you mentioned because we're only eating one meal? Uh, could that count as far as intermittent fasting? And as far as the charcoal, what about those of us who take supplements like DHA, EPA, uh, vitamin D, how does that interfere with the charcoal and how can we take it if we're taking those other supplements? Thank you, great, David. Great question, geez. Okay, now charcoal does not interfere with like macronutrients like DHA, EPA, magnesium, calcium. Um, your normal protein metabolism. So charcoal, it's really interesting. So then you're going like, wait a second. So it's selective. And the answer is yes, it is selective. The, the research on charcoal is unclear. This is crazy. This is one of the most studied substances in human history. Charcoal, it's it, incredible. Tens of thousands of studies on it in history. Nobody's really sure how it works. That's what's so nuts about it. People like, no, it absorbs things like a sponge. I know how it works. It's like, no, actually it doesn't. It adsorbs, not absorbs. What's the difference? Well, adsorption means that it's electrochemical. So it selects certain things. I generally think it's an electrochemical phenomenon from my perspective. You know, some people say it's Van der Waals forces or pie stacking. If you get into the science of it, it's that it's like they're basically saying it's Van der Waals forces and pie stacking that's really causing charcoal's adsorption. But neither of those are actually the real answer because pie stacking and Van der Waals forces work at only very, very, very small distances. And we know that charcoal will attract to itself, like if you put open charcoal in your refrigerator, all the gases in that refrigerator will end up in that charcoal. So all the odors, for example. So it's acting at a distance. It's acting at a distance. That's the thing that's unexplainable in the scientific literature. So it's it's an interesting one. Now, you know, how much should you take? Again, 500 milligrams is a good place to start. And is it possible to take charcoal? Like, can you just take it with your like dinner? Yeah, yeah, I do all the time. Um, now, let me say one more thing about that before I let you go is that if you fast 18 hours a day, geez, you're doing good. So, uh, you know, I would stack that into your hours of uh, a scene fasting, but generally for myself, I always consider it every 24 hour period, but that's my own little, my own little prejudice on that one. Thanks so much, David. Up next, we have Lori. Hi, Lori. Hi. Hi, David. I've Hi, been Lori. following you for years. Um, but I, I missed the first part of this. I jumped in kind of in the middle, I guess. Um, so, but I was wondering, did you talk about, um, or what are your thoughts about cleanse, like doing a detox through the feet, like foot soaks and, you know, they have foot pads that they have now um, with herbs and things. What do you think about those things? Great. There's a, there's a, um, okay. So I have a long history with this. For a lot of years, the actual original product was called the Jing Orb. You could look that up. You could like punch that up, jingorb.com, J-I-N-G-O-R-B.com. In fact, you might even see my face on that website because I'm a big promoter of that product, or it was in the past when we were doing a lot of trade shows. That was the original foot bath product. Then people came along and kind of knocked it off with like, they're just running an electrical current through the water. And, you know, then they're saying that's a foot detox. Maybe it is. I, I'm not going to say it isn't, but the Jing Orb product is much more impressive. That's one of those post electromagnetic field products. And you, you take the ball that's attached to the to the console and you throw it in a bathtub with you or you throw it in your foot bath with you or you can put your hands in it or how it just has to go through water and touch your skin in some way. And that has a very incredible history. That particular product, again, different from the other foot bath products. The, the Jing Orb has a, an ability to affect what is called, let me see if I can recall this, it's called the unfolded protein problem, which is a major issue in cellular biology. I mean, you, you probably never heard that. I mean, I'm, everyone's listening right now going, the unfolded protein problem, what the heck is that? Never heard of that. But if you look into it, it's a massive issue. It's a massive problem. What is it? Well, what happens is, is that when the machinery of the cell is manufacturing proteins, as the cell ages, or let's say it's hit by a virus or something goes wrong with the cell, the actual manufacturing assembly line starts to back up waste. 
and you have what's called like the folding of the protein gets broken down, the process gets broken down and the cellular mechanics break up. And then the cell goes, basically it becomes aged or disturbed or it becomes constipated or the cell starts to die. It's called the unfolded protein problem. And the original technology of the foot bath, that's still available now is the Jing Orb, was the product that actually affected under clinical research, the unfolded protein problem. It, it resolves it. So it's really an interesting subject. My God, in fact, a woman who, she's a big part of the Jing Orb group or that team, she actually did a PhD on it, on the unfolded protein problem and that technology and how it affects it. Now, again, that's not true of all foot baths, but that particular one has a property. I, I, I know I could you know go on for hours about this stuff. There's so many tools out there. You see how, how many tools there are and how few we're getting. You go to a doctor's office, they're like, here's a drug, here's an injection, that's it, get it out the door. It's like, what about all of this technology that's out there that's here now? Miracle stuff. 